Welcome to One Plus One. I'm Kurt Fernley. A decade ago, Taria Pitt was running an ultra marathon through the Kimberley when a grass fire would cause burns to 65% of her body. The doctors weren't sure that she would survive, but she encapsulates what it is to have grit and determination. 10 years on, she's a mother, author, and running more than ever. So what goes through your head when you're running? Usually, like, it's just a nice voice going, like, good job, you're doing this. Well done, just got to get around the corner, girl. But, like, sometimes I'll be like, oh, you look like an idiot. <laughs> um, you know, you... Mine's a punished voice. Mine is a, you should be going faster. Yeah, my like, God, your voice sounds scary. <laughs> What does running mean to you now, Taria? Um, I guess for me, it's just a bit of an escape. It's sort of like my therapy, you know. It'll help calm me down, it'll manage my emotions. So running's more about evening yourself out. It makes me feel good about who I am and, I don't know, it's hard to articulate. Oh, it's about finding your happy place. Yeah. Rhea Pitt, welcome to One Plus One. Thank you so much for having me. It's so lovely to be here with you. What role does running play in your life now? I think, like, when I was training for Ironman, it was more about challenging myself and making sure I hit those markers during my run and making sure I did it in certain times and everything. But now, you know, as a mum of two, it's just <laughs> about carving out a little fraction in the day for myself. And I know that when I leave, I might be in a shitty mood and I might feel really annoyed at something, but I'll go out and after five minutes, I'll, I'll feel myself start to relax and start to unwind and start to enjoy the process of just running. And then when I come home, I'm just, I'm in a good mood, I'm happy, I'm lighthearted, I'm more joyful. So I think for me, it does make me a better parent. Was there a time where you thought you wouldn't be able to enjoy that, where, where you wouldn't be able to run? Well, yeah, because, you know, in hospital, I couldn't even wipe my own ass, you know, I couldn't stand up by myself. So I thought, well, if I can't stand up, how the hell will I be able to walk again, run again, go back to work, compete again, have a family with Michael? And so really in those early days, I guess there, there was uncertainty around what my future may or may not look like. How long did it take for you, for you to get through that uncertainty to, to know that you were going to be able to live the active life that you're, you're living now? I think sometimes there's, <laughs> there's still uncertainty, right? Because, you know, in those days when people would try to, I guess I tried to temper my expectations. So they would say, you know, you might not be able to do all that, those physical activities that you once enjoyed, but um, on the upside, you might drive again, you might get a job, you might even get married. And so for me, it was, so immensely frustrating because it was like the bar had just been set really low and, you know, it was almost like I had to be happy with just doing those simple everyday tasks that most people would take for granted. I was told as a kid that I might be able to push buttons in a lift. And I remember that day yeah. where Mama, they called me over and asked me what I, what I wanted to be and I said I want to be a firefighter. And I remember them telling mum and dad that, well, he might be able to sit in a lift and push buttons. What, what, what does that do to someone, that, that low bar? It's hard, right? I think I was lucky because I, I, I had a really supportive base. I had Michael, my partner, he was, he was my rock. He's been my rock throughout my whole journey. I had my mum who was with me in, my, in the corner. I had my brothers who were there every day, you know, and they would say, Tere, you can do whatever you want. If you want to go do an Ironman, like, get out of bed. Let's go training. Let's go get you working towards that. Yeah, you're going to be able to run again. You're going to be able to surf again. So even though I had these, this team of, of medical experts around me who were 
trying to manage my expectations. And, you know, expectation management, it, it's something we all do because you don't want to disappoint anyone. So I understand the reasons for doing that. But I guess I was lucky because I had such a strong and supportive base of people that I knew believed in me. And, and I guess I guess you would have had the same too, right, Kurt? Yeah. Yeah. It was that there was a moment, I think, that my mum and dad ignored it, so I had to ignore it. Yeah, and they would have been like, well, don't listen to them. Only, only you know what's possible, you know what I mean? And I did have some doctors in the hospital who would say, well, we don't know. We actually don't know what you can achieve, so you've just got to go do whatever it is that you want to and, you know, we can all learn from that. You have done Ironman. Yeah, you, you have done... You've climbed mountains. You did Kokoda. How? How did you get to that point where... I know how hard Kokoda is. Like. Yeah. It's kind of my personality, right? When someone tells me I can't do something, it's just like waving a red flag in front of a bull. I know I know nothing of that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, like, when, when they tried to manage my expectations, I was almost like, well, fuck you. Like, what would you know? I'm going to go do an Ironman. I'm going to do all of these things. And so I think that was part of the initial motivation for me to want to do these crazy things. But once I did the World Championships of Ironman, I was like, well, I've done it now. Like, I don't, I don't have anything else left to prove, almost. But then I fell pregnant with my first son, Huckavai, and I remember I thought, once I get this baby out, I'm going to get straight back into Ironman, I'm going to do something crazy again. And then I had this little baby, and then I just... I didn't, I didn't feel that, that urge or that need or, or that motivation to be wanting to train every day or challenge myself all of the time. But I, I did do a 30-kilometre mountain run after I had Huckabye. But and when I told people I was doing that, they, they said, oh, you know, that's not really that hard compared to what you've been, what you've been through or what you've done. But I think that's an important lesson for goal setting though, right? Because I think you can't, you can't compare yourself to what everyone else is doing and you can't compare yourself to what previous versions of yourself might have been able to have done. I think if it's a challenge for you, then that's, that's enough. What emotion do you feel when you cross that finish line in an Ironman or when you get to I was corner at Kokoda? Re relief. <laughs> <laughs> relief, like just this feeling of like ev everything just gets sucked out of me and I'm like, oh, oh, that's so good. I don't have to do anything like that ever again. But I, I generally but you do. I generally do, yeah. But I haven't this past year though, because I, I had another baby and then COVID hit. So I was, you know, it was last year was for me an enjoyable year because I, I had this beautiful little baby that I got to spend so much time with and it was more about relishing that, the slowness of life. I realised who you were from the very first story that I ever heard about you, that there was a, a young woman in the north of Australia who was going to do an ultra marathon with two weeks preparation. I've done, I've done 80 marathons. At no point once in my life did I ever think about wanting to do two in a day. Not once, never. Let alone with two weeks warning. Yeah. What do you, what do you remember about that first race? Well, I guess I was obviously really excited because I, I love um, competing in things. And, you know, we all got the bus out to the start of the race and everything was happy and fine and normal and I started running and then there was one checkpoint about 10 kilometres and then a second checkpoint, which was about 20 kilometres. And then about a quarter of the way through the race, so at the 25 kilometre mark, I remember hearing what I thought were road trains, right? And I thought, oh, that's great because that means I'm close to the next checkpoint because I knew the next checkpoint was just over the other side of the highway. And that sound of those road trains was, wasn't road trains at all. It was the sound of a raging inferno that was going on in the gorge beneath me. Do you remember what happened after that? Like, it... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was, there was six of us there at the time. We had two choices. We could go back the way that we'd come, but that would mean going through shoulder-high grass, so perfect fuel for the flames, or we could go up the side of the gorge, which was rocky, um, and had less vegetation, but fire travels faster going uphill. So both of our options were sh 
pretty shit. Um, and I chose to go up the side of the hill. I chose to run up the side of the gorge. The runners were taking part in a three-day, 100-kilometre race through the remote Kimberley region on Friday when fire tore through the area. Michael Hull and three other competitors tried to run away from the blaze but eventually became trapped by the wall of fire. What we did instantaneously was just stop and just ran back in through the wall of flame because we knew that the, the flame that was high, um, when you're on the other side of it, there was nothing left to burn. 35-year-old Kate Sanderson and 24-year-old Taria Pitt are still fighting for their lives in hospitals in Melbourne and Sydney. How often do you think about that day now? I think it depends, right? Like, because sometimes I won't think about it for, I don't know, like a month or six weeks or whatever. And then sometimes if I can't open a jar of pasta sauce, Normally I'm pretty good, I'll be like, Dar, can you just open this jar for me? Or I've got a jar opening tool or whatever. But if I'm already feeling in a bad mood or disheartened or I haven't, haven't been from my run, <laughs> I will get, sometimes I'll get really frustrated and I'll be like, I can't even open this stupid jar of pasta sauce. And then I'll think, if I didn't get trapped by that fire, I'd be able to do this right now. So it's not that I think about the event when I was injured, but it, it's just in areas of my life when I'm reminded that some things, as hard as I try, there's some things that I just can't do. Like, you know, open a jar of pasta sauce. Um, and so it's only when things like that happen, I'm, I'm reminded of, I guess I'm reminded of my inadequacies. And that, that hurts, that hurts my ego, because I'm a, like a proud, strong, motivated, determined individual. And when you realise that there's something you can't do, and it's not something like finish a 30 kilometre mountain run or finish an ultra marathon or finish an Ironman. It's something really simple that most people can do. I find that really frustrating. Yeah. I don't know, do you, do you ever... Yeah, I do. Yeah. There's, there, there's something extremely challenging, more harder than crawl on Kokoda is yeah. becoming trying to become comfortable with your vulnerabilities. Yeah, and so that's, and that's, I think that's what I've, you know, as a young 24 year old mining engineer, um, I wasn't, I don't think most 24 year olds even think about this stuff, but I don't think I ever thought about being vulnerable or how important it is to acknowledge when, you know, you're not good at things or if you're not doing things right. But I think, for me, over the past few years, I've just had to accept that there's some things I can't do, ask for help if it's going to make my life easier, and try and be OK with it. I'm not, I'm not OK with it sometimes. Sometimes I'm totally fine and can ask someone for help. Other times I just think, fuck, like, why can't I? This is so frustrating for me. For a parliamentary inquiry found the event organiser Racing the Planet did not take reasonable steps to ensure the safety of participants. Talk us through the amount of recovery it took after, the, after that, um, I don't know what to say, incident yeah. after, the, after yeah. the, the day. After that catastrophic bushfire? After that one, <laughs> yeah. Uh, recovery was, oh, that was, that was, I don't even know how to describe it because it was literally pretty much just Michael and my mum every day, just waking up every morning in a body that wouldn't listen to me. I couldn't, I couldn't even bend my elbows. So I, they were also fired out here. So I couldn't, if I had an itchy nose, I couldn't scratch my nose. I, I had to go through these dressing changes every day, these bandage changes, which would go for hours and hours in which I, I found so intensely painful. And it, was, it wasn't as if I just had to do it once, I had to do it every day. I had to do physio sessions every day, which I hated and which were painful. And every morning when I'd wake up, I'd think, I have to, I have to do what I did yesterday. I have to do that again today. And so I think for me, hospital, I had to learn that I couldn't be achieving really fantastic things straight away. I had to be happy with, well, I walked five metres today, you know? Part of me felt that, that that was pathetic, to be able to walk five metres, you know? But the other part of me thought, well, 
No, Tree, you've been through something horrific, catastrophic. You, you're trying to rebuild build yourself and you've got to take, you've got to take your wins where you can. And walking five metres from where you've been, that's amazing. Like, well done. And I remember every night before I went to sleep, I would do this little, like, pump up in my head and I'd, <laughs> I'd be lying there in bed. I'd, I'd just think of the things that I'd done well that day. I'd think, you know what, you walked, you walked eight metres a day. That's awesome, go you. Or you, you did an additional... Um, stare on the staircase, like, go you, like, good job. And even if I hadn't done anything great that day, I'd say, well, you know what? Another day's gone, you've survived, you're still here. So all you're gonna do is wake up tomorrow and do the same thing again. And if you keep doing that enough times, surely by the end of a year, you'll be in a better place than you are today. Did that just happen naturally, creating that voice? I went to lessons to learn about positive affirmation and visualisations. Did that just I think I got the... that from my parents. I got that from both my parents because they were always, you know, my mum's a writer, so she's really strong on the power of language and how we talk to ourselves. So again, I think I was got super lucky to have these really strong individuals as my parents, as, as role models. And then to have Michael in my corner, who was just supportive, compassionate, understanding. He's He's actually really annoying because he's <laughs> he's so nice and he's just such a great guy. Um, yeah, everyone likes him more than way more than me. But yeah, so I had all, I had all these really beautiful people in my corner. But I also think you can have all of this support, you can have all of these amazing people. But at the end of the day, the responsibility of my recovery was on me. Like I had beautiful nurses and and brilliant surgeons who are all doing their best for me. But I had to be the one to do my physio sessions. I had to be the one to go through the pain. I had to be the one to to come up with the courage to face to face every single day being like a completely different version of myself. You know, all of those things were really, really hard. So how many operations have you had in recovery? I think probably I've had now over 200 surgical procedures. And so within an operation, when you go, under anaesthetics, they could do like maybe four or five different procedures all over your body. Um, so typically I would average, well, once I was out of that initial, you know, life or death, don't know why I laughed, that's just my sense of humour, I'm sorry. <laughs> that life or death phase, um, probably I was having maybe three or four operations a year, but I didn't have any last year because of COVID. So what I would really love to do is get my nose fixed because I still have trouble breathing through my nose. And if you're an athlete, that is something that is really frustrating to not be able to breathe at full capacity through your nose. Are the operations a necessity or are they...? No, no. So, I, you know, I'm thankful I'm at a place now where the operations, they're, not, they're no longer life-saving or no longer urgent or no longer necessary. But for me, each operation that I have, it improves the qual my quality of life. So like being able to breathe through your nose is a big deal. Um, being able to, you know, make a pincer grip with my thumb and finger is a, is a big deal in terms of function. So for me, each operation I have, it does improve me in terms of function and appearance as well. What's the biggest lesson that you have learned about yourself in the recovery? I think the biggest lesson, and I, I've always been a high achiever, like I did well at school and I did well at uni and when I, want, when I wanted something I could always find a way to make it happen. But I think during my recovery, because I was just, you know, I, I died three times on the operating table, my physical abilities were completely stripped away, I had a skinhead, I didn't look anything like Taria looked like. Um, and so for me, starting from that point there where I had I had nothing to sort of to work with or to go with. I, I guess I realised that it was a real lesson for me that if I just put in the work, and, and you would you would know this, Kurt, but if you just if you just put in the work, have faith that the work that you're doing is going to make progress. I think that that was the biggest lesson I took out of it, and I also learnt as well like that the people in my life that I loved, I learnt, I guess I learnt how much they meant to me. Because I think before the fire, 
I was probably a bit self-absorbed. And I mean, I was a young person, like all young people are. That's, that's what you do when you're young. But I think I just, I never really realised like how amazing Michael is, how amazing my mum is, how amazing my family was. I think I just took, took those people in my life for granted. What does life look like now as Terea Pitt, mama too? It's mostly just keeping two young people, two small people alive. Um, that's a big, big part of it. You know, I write, I do speeches, I've got digital courses and things like that. I work with really amazing brands. Um, but I think if I was to say what I was most proud of, I actually think it's the relationship with my partner, Michael, because we were really young people. We were, we hadn't, we, I've known Michael since I've been 12. I've, I met him when he was working at the local supermarket in Ulladulla. He was my, he was my brother's best friend. Um, but I think, you know, we'd only been together for like two years and then we had this crazy, horrific, catastrophic event happen to both of us. And I'm proud of how we've both navigated it. And I think it really has solidified our partnership. And I think if there was someone in this world that I would want to be sharing my life with, it would be Michael. Yeah. And how has he settled into parenthood? He loves it. Does he. he... He loves it. He's an amazing dad. He's awesome. Have you spoken to your kids about difference and yeah, disability? Yeah, yeah. And I think my youngest one, Rahid, is only one, right? So whatever. He doesn't even know what's going on. But Hakavai is three and he is just incessant with the questions. So he's always saying, what happened to you? Why do your hands look different? What's on your face? Why don't you have an ear? All of those questions. And I just try to answer them honestly and just say, well, remember, darling, we, we talked about this. I was burnt and this is a scar, you know? I think we don't give enough credit to our kids because I actually think they are incredibly resilient and they don't really have a problem processing difficult information like that. So he'll just be like, oh, yeah, she was burnt. I get it. You know, what about what about you? What's your yeah? I I I always spoke to the kids about who I am yeah, and about how um, I love them. I love me. Yeah, you know, like that yeah. that whole idea that I'm your dad and you're gonna get questions about me as well. Yeah, and yeah. give them the skills to be able to handle it. Yeah, because nothing is more <laughs> confronting, and I, I will happily hit a press back and have a yarn, but you should see the uh, the conversations you have, like, at daycare or at school. Oh, yeah, I get lots of questions when I drop off Haki White daycare. And some kids are like, Haki, your mum's here. And another kid would be like... <laughs> <laughs> and I'd be like, hello, how are you? They'd be like... Like, almost like they can't, they can't... You know, they, they don't know what they're saying, yeah. So I just try to be normal, as, as normal as I can, and just say, just say hello. And if they say, oh, what, what happened to you? I just say, well, I was, in a, I was in a fire and I got burnt. You know, that's, I think that's all I need to do. We're down here in yeah, the, the beautiful South Coast. What, what does this place mean to you? Well, this is going to sound a bit tragic, but this is a place where I grew up. So I went to Ulladulla Primary School. I went to Ulladulla High School. Um, this is where I grew up surfing and exploring and being active. I think it's a beautiful thing knowing that you've got, you know, those people around you that believe in you and support you. And I think from this beautiful community of mine, I've never felt anything but love and encouragement and support and feeling like people were, were really in my corner and really, really backing me. I mean, when I had my accident, some girlfriends down here organised a masquerade ball for me. That was indifference to me because I, had, I was wearing my compression mask. You know, that, that ball raised 60 grand, which is amazing amount of money for such a small community. And I think that's just a demonstration of how people down here help each other out and support each other. And I remember when the fires were on um, last year down here, they were really horrific. We had fires burning all around this area. And I think it's, you know, in times of crisis that people really, really step up to the plate, they step up to the fore. And I really saw that again when we had the fires down here. How did you handle that? There was smoke every day. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty triggering. I've got to be honest, it was pretty triggering. And I felt about as useful as a broken zipper on a wetsuit because I wasn't organising any food drops. I wasn't, you know, evacuating any neighbours from nearby towns. I was eight months pregnant. I had my toddler at home. 
And that whole time, it was hard for me because I was, all, I was just thinking about the fire that I'd been in and how these fires were triggering me every single day. And I think what I did, which was a, a real blessing for me, is that a girlfriend came over and we created something called Spend With Them. I don't, I don't know if you ever saw it, but it was just an Instagram campaign where we profiled businesses from fire-affected communities. So if you had a business in the town of Mogo, which had been badly burnt, we would profile your business on the page. Then people all over Australia and all over the world could find out about your business, um, buy something from you, support you know the town morale, boost the local economy, and put money in the hands of people who really, really needed it at the time. And that, for me, was such a good thing because instead of me thinking about how terrified I was during these fires and how triggering they were for me, I was like, oh man, we've got to enter this business into the database and get them on the spreadsheet and get them profiled. And so it shifted my focus away from, you know, how these fires are affecting me into doing something positive for my community. It's been, it's been 10 years since the, since the accident. Mm. What do you think your life would look like 10 years from now? I don't know. Um, There's got to be something out there that you are got in the back of the mind thinking, I'm going to get that. I don't know. Like, I feel, I'm going to use this word, I feel abundantly happy right now. I'm re I feel really, and this sounds really sickening as well, but I feel really blessed with my family that I've created and with the work that I get to do on a daily basis. For sure, there's heaps of cool stuff that I'd love to do. I would love to sail a boat like traditional Tahitian navigators. I'd love to do I did a rod, <laughs> that, you know, that Alaskan sled dog race across the top of Alaska. I would, um, I'd love to do the Burke and Wills track. It goes from, you know, Melbourne up to Darwin. I'd love to like run that. Wouldn't that be cool? So all of these things I would love, all of these things I'd love to do and I always see things and I'm like, that would be awesome to become a professional salsa dancer. Like, that would be amazing to be able to do that. Um, so, I don't know. For now, I'm really busy, though, with my kids. Terea Pitt, thanks for the run and thanks for joining me on One Plus One. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I really, really loved speaking with you.